Welcome to the Veraxis Mega Panel for Sid Meier's Civilization Beyond Earth. My name is Chris Waters. I'll be the moderator today. Uh, usually I'm writing or hosting videos or whatnot and making a goofy smile. Uh, GameSpot.com. I'm not going to be the one doing most of the talking. It's going to be these four to my right, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And uh, without further ado, let's start with you, Lena. Sure. So my name's Lena Brenk. I'm the lead producer. I'm Anton Stringer. I'm the gameplay designer. I'm Will Miller. I'm the co-lead designer. I'm David McDonough. I'm the other co-lead designer. Uh, we announced this game at PAX East, uh, and we're just shocked. Some people were there, I'm sure. So thank you. Um, this, and we said the same thing at PAX East, but this game is really for you. Like, our fans are our biggest asset, and we are so happy that you're here. And thank you very much for coming out today. We really appreciate it. Yeah. You guys have been co-designers on games before and have been really working together as a team for a long time. Can you give us a little insight as to how that came about and sort of what launched you guys on the path to Beyond Earth? Um, yes, co-lead designers. Uh, David and I are a creative team, um, but more so I think the whole the whole team contributes to the, the creative energy and direction of this game. Uh, but the two of us met in college way back when, and I didn't like him very much when I met him the first time. He had this funny hat on, which he's probably carrying with him right now. Um, but we shared classes together and started making games together and uh, went through college learning to do that. Uh, and through lots of luck and some perseverance, landed at Firaxis at about the same time. And here we are today. It's a, it's a really special thing to be here. Once you landed at Firaxis, you guys have worked on some games there before together, but Beyond Earth, sort of, for a long time, even before you started development on it, was something you guys had in mind, were kind of angling for. How did, what, what set you on that trajectory? Yeah, so before we got to do this game, we made a, a mobile game called uh, Haunted Hollow, which was a lot of fun. And while we were making that game, we are sort of uh, whispering in some ears around at Firaxis for the idea of doing a Civ in space, which, like, uh, like many of our fans, we've been wanting to see Firaxis do for quite a long time. We both grew up on the Civ series. Um, Civ 2 and Alpha Centauri were two of my first Civs. And so I am like among the ranks of, of our legions of fans who were saying, please, Firaxis, can you make this one again? And eventually, once again, sort of by sheer luck, the, the circumstances aligned and the company directors came to us and said, you know that game you've been talking about, we might have an opportunity to do that. And, you know, without, I, without in my opinion, really earning it or deserving it at all, we, we became leads of, of the new idea of, of Civ in the future, which turned into Beyond Earth. So um, we couldn't be more grateful or more pleased that, uh, that, it was, that it fell to us to get to do this thing. We've been huge fans of this idea and really enthusiastic about it ever since we came to Firaxis ever since we started to play games, so it's really a dream come true to make this game. Feast your eyes on the gameplay action here, and guys, take it away. So what we're looking at now is a um, bit more mid to late game. If you followed the coverage we've been doing so far, we saw a lot of early game, but we wanted to share some more late game uh, fun with you and the effects and stuff and gameplay systems we have in the game here. Um, one of the things you'll also notice is the fungal biome. And um, so, since I have gameplay designers and designers with me, <laughs> I'll just let them talk about the gameplay system they implemented each and while we go through and actually look at it in action. Yeah, so Lena mentioned the fungal biome here. Um, we've shown off two biomes already, the, uh, the lush biome, which is very terrestrial, the arid biome, which looks like something straight out of Frank Herbert's Dune. And this one, which is, I think, the most uh, bizarre and strange of the environments that you can play in. Um, and this, the, the biome is just one of the aspects of our map generation system. Um, underneath that are the map scripts, which we've written to um, make really interesting gameplay environments for you to play in. And those are also moddable, so we're really excited to see what our team can do there. Um, but we're also playing um, a purity sieve here, a purity affinity-oriented uh, sieve. So we can walk around the map and kind of explain what's going on here. 
So one of the things that you're seeing is um, we're playing as Brasilia, and we've already started to improve our landscape. Uh, one of the big things about the Purity Affinity, and actually their victory type, the Promised Land, is about making this new alien planet into a sort of new Earth, a new place for humanity to thrive in the way that it was originally intended. And so we have a lot of farmlands going across here in between our capital of Citadella and Manuel. And uh, kind of beneath the road that we have going there, we also have some terrascapes, which are some kind of late game improvements that are really cool. Yeah, the terrascapes are, are sort of hard to maintain, but they're, they're sort of the best, the absolute best improvement you can have, and Purity likes them a lot. Yeah, so we're bringing a little bit of Earth and the genetics that we came with on our, our spacecraft, and we're recreating them here on this very alien planet. So growing actual trees instead of just giant mushroom trees? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Um, I think we also have a solar collector in orbit over our city. I'm just about to be launched, actually, yeah. So we, we have a solar collector built here. Um, the orbital layer system is one of the really fun things that's new and very different from historical civilization games. So we're launching it over our, our farms and our hills there outside our, of our capital. And what that's going to do is that's going to increase our energy output of those tiles. And it's going to stay in orbit for about 50, 60 turns. And then it's going to crash down. It might create a crash satellite salvage that we can go and pick up for some extra resources. Um, but the uh, the solar collector is really useful for maintaining your economy. And of course, there's uh, other orbital units as well. You don't have to just have peaceful ones. There are some military-minded ones, ones that let you transport your units and kind of backdoor attack an enemy that you don't like very much, ones that'll uh, you know, bombard a we'll unit. We'll see some of those a little later, I think. Yeah, there's one that's coming up. <laughs> So another uh, system that uh, is really fun is the virtue system. So we've just accumulated enough culture in order to develop the virtues of our civilization. And this, uh, some of you Civ Five players may recognize this as sort of similar to the social policy system, but it behaves much more like a, like a skill tree of an RPG character. So there's these four categories of virtues that you can develop, and these represent kind of sort of philosophical attitudes, government choices that your people make on this new planet. And it's independent from what technologies you do, what affinities you do, so you could have a very might supremacy focused civ, or you could have a, a peaceful prosperity growing supremacy civ. Um, so the four categories across the top are might, prosperity, knowledge, and industry, and they each kind of have a different gameplay focus. They each make you stronger in different ways. And um, in addition to choosing what category you want to emphasize, you can also choose whether to kind of drill down in one category. Like, I really like knowledge, I'm going to get all the technology, all the culture. Or you can kind of spread wide as we've done here. So um, bonuses in the rows or in the columns, like once you reach a certain threshold, you'll get, a, you'll get a kicker bonus. And those are some of the most powerful bonuses in the game. So those are really worth shooting for. So we have enough culture. Um, probably the way it looks like we are um, just about to get our next synergy bonus in the knowledge tree if we get one more. So we're going to go down to the bottom there and choose techno artisans, which gives us extra science based on our culture output. So it just is, synergizes really nicely with what we're doing. And the bonus will give us 10% science in our city, which is really awesome. So we're going to do that. Would anyone here consider themselves a techno artisan? <laughs> no? <laughs> All right, we got one in the back. Excellent. One back there. So this is one of our, our most favorite systems. Um, one of the new ideas for the game is the, uh, the web-based technology, the central radial style design. And in this game, about midway through, we've gotten a fair few. Our frontier is pushed out sort of to the fringes where things start to get a little more uh, sci-fi, a little more uh, extreme. So one of, the, one of the branches that we've made our way out to so far uh, is planetary engineering, which represents kind of like the furthest you can go along the, the terraforming path to where you can re-architect the planet itself to, a, to an extent. And it provides a number of really interesting uh, specialty powers. One of them is uh, access to a, a leave tech for the purity affinity called seismic induction, which lets you build the Archimedes Lever, which is a massive building-sized wonder that uh, is a, basically it's a tectonic weapon. Uh, it, it attacks units that approach the city through, um, by pounding the ground underneath them, effectively. And so that's just one of, um, of almost two dozen sci-fi wonders in the game that are sort of designed around this style of, they represent um, really elaborate, imaginary, extreme expressions of all the various uh, ways that you could deepen your technological advancement. So, Planetary engineering and the terraforming techs lead to, you know, nice domestic happy things like the solar collector, but also uh, hideous, powerful, devastating things like, uh, like the Archimedes lever. And um, so you can pan up a little bit. You can see some of the other options. Um, places we didn't go yet but could, um, transgenics and uh, artificial evolution. You can swing up higher up and uh, see the more harmony style techs like um, uh, 
So, excuse me. It's, you haven't gone quite far. Like, there, there, there it is. Designer life forms, which lets you um, make the <laughs> rocktopus, among other things. Um, did you just say rocktopus? I did say rocktopus. <laughs> if you watched the first uh, Firaxis live stream, you, um, you hopefully were treated to an, an extensive explanation by Anton where that name came from. Um, we thought someone would change it, and no one did. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it was, we, we wanted a, a floating air unit that Supremacy, mm -hmm. or Harmony. Harmony would use in the late game. We were thinking, oh, yeah, like dragons would be cool, but it's not, like we wanted something really unique. So we were like, what if there's this, this floating jellyfish octopus thing, and it uses the float stone, which is one of the resources in the game, mm -hmm. to just kind of float above the earth and uses its tendrils to get, get gather food from the bottom. And so it's this kind of like genetically engineered awesome unit and it's it's really interesting too because it um it's actually an orbital unit so it kind of floats along the ground doesn't really do anything but it can transport to the front lines then it kind of floats into orbit and can spew acid gex <laughs> at enemies it's very powerful and because it's an orbital unit like you know other guys have a really tough time shooting back <laughs> and then when you're done with it you can uh, the octopus floats back down normally the the satellites will crash but the octopus is very personal you float back down you can reposition it you know you know, further down the battle line or wherever you need it and kind of float it back up again. Start feeding again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the funny part of that was that um, we got pretty late in production, right about the time when localization needed to lock down and we needed to, you know, make sure that all our ducks were in a row. And Anton comes in one day and he says, guys, are we shipping this game, calling it the Rocktopus? Guys, <laughs> is, this, is this what we're going to call it? And I Dave was, and I were like, yes. like, yeah, of course. I was a Absolutely. little too serious. <laughs> so serious. Yeah. No, you misunderstand, sir. <laughs> Rocktopus is a great pun. And it, uh, another pun you'll notice is the technology that it's on is called designer life forms. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I mean, yeah, it's like genetic design, and, but it's also us as designers making our favorite life form. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you mean you? Uh, Basically. It's all of us. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, yeah, so, um, so that's just a couple tidbits of uh, fun stuff on the web. If you swing around to the left, you can, you can just glance over a few more. But um, this has been a real pleasure to work on. Obviously, like this is one of the purest expressions of um, the fun and imagination that we got to put in this game. Like, you know, what was the future going to be? One of everything. They're all crazy and silly. Let's have them all. And so, like, you know, uh, bioengineering and biometallurgy. You can make like living skyscrapers, uh, augmentation. Um, you know, advanced robotics, artificial intelligence, thinking computers, uh, battle droids. It's all. It's all in there somewhere. Yeah, we can have them all, and then you need to choose. Right. That's basically what it comes down to. Well, just to. play the game ten times, and then you can get them all. That. Right. One of the fundamental differences between the tech tree in Civ V and the tech web in Beyond Earth is that you won't, in one uh, play session, research all of the techs in the game, probably 60 or 70 percent, um, which is different. And usually in a Civ V game, everyone has all the techs by the end of the game. So this, this uh, does a couple things for us. It, it makes the game a lot more replayable, but it also diversifies the Civs that are playing against you. So even if you play against the same neighbor twice in two different games, um, they may choose a totally different tech path, uh, and you'll have to figure that out as you go. So it, it's a much more dynamic and versatile system, and we're really happy with the way it turned out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not everybody will get the Rocktopus. <laughs> right. And each of the leaders, too, like um, you know, all of our sponsor leaders, they're not predisposed to... You know, uh, fielding doesn't always go for supremacy or always for purity. You're going to see not only you change every time, but like Dave said, all your opponents are going to be changing too. And the leader appearances will change in reaction to that. And the cities that they build, the technologies they research, and the units they bring to the battlefield. So you might have fielding, you know, kind of marching down you with supremacy fronts on one game, or you might have her floating rock to us as a late game harmony player in another game. Do you think you could introduce that. us to her? Yeah, yeah speaking <laughs> of which. Let's go to the Why don't you, yeah, drop, in, drop into diplomacy. So um, one of the other really cool things that we get to do uh, in this game that we, um, that no previous Civ has done is make the leaders actually change over time as their uh, you know, decisions come to bear on their civilization and their identity starts to evolve. So here we're talking to Suzanne Fielding, leader of ARC, the American Reclamation Corporation one of the more ruthless and power mad civs in the game. And she's going in the supremacy direction, which you can tell from the sort of like slate gray, kind of um, icy looking um, gear that she's now sporting. And this is um, one step along the path. She can get even more devoted to, to this affinity and look even more terrifying by the end of the game. But one of the interesting um, things we're gonna get to show off here is a, a new concept for the game that we're very excited about for diplomacy called the favors system, which is uh, a diplomatic currency. Diplomacy isn't going to always be the sexiest system in Civ. Like, you know, 
You don't like walk. You know, you don't walk around the halls of PAX and hear people talking about, "Hey, did you check out that new diplomacy system?" Man, I totally want to play that. But it's it's really powerful in a game like Civ. Um, but in the past, it's always been kind of it's been a little hard to tell what was going on and hard to really fold into your strategy. So we came up with this idea for a diplomatic currency called favors, where you leaders will do things for you and give you favor, or you'll do things for them and give you favors sort of as kind of IOUs. And you can bank these up and then cash them in to make the leader do things later on in the game, up to and including declaring war in your, in your stead on a person you don't like. So you can trade them in for, you know, you know, resources, you know, I happen to need a thousand energy right now, you owe me five favors, do it. Or you can like bank them up 15, 16, 17 favors and then late in the game when maybe you're going to make your victory run and you need to distract the world population a little bit, <laughs> you can call up one leader, force him to declare war on another one, and just kind of like kick over the anthill and let them all fight each other while you go and win the game. <laughs> so we, we've got a favor over, over um, Suzanne right now, enough to get a, a few strategic resources out of her that we might need for some more, some niftier orbital units, things like that. Um, will she accept that? Excellent. Excellent. So the favors idea came from, I, like, it was really, really late in the process. It um, was. The, it was really, oh, really late Lena in was the process. Not pleased. She was not pleased. <laughs> um, so, Lena's our producer. She makes sure that we don't totally go off the rails with all our crazy ideas. I try. Yes. And that, uh, that, has to, that has to be more and more a reality as we get closer and closer to ship, obviously. But David and I had been ruminating on diplomacy for a while, and he came in one morning just ecstatic because he had, he had thought of a way to, to add something cool to diplomacy. The problem was, like, it was after content lock, it was close to you know, another major deadline. It was like, we should not be adding features to this game right now. Mm -hmm. um, but we did, and we just didn't tell anybody about it. <laughs> <laughs> Such a small change. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, it turned out really well. Luckily, yeah. it didn't what do you Sorry. mean, luckily? This is, we knew what we were doing. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. Well, yeah, we, I was trying to describe the system, and I was like, um, what, like, think of the movie The Godfather. Like, what was important to Don Corleone? It wasn't, you know, resources and money and thugs. It was influence, right? It was the ability to manipulate the other people and get them to do what he wanted them to do when he wanted them to do it. And that was the one thing that diplomacy always lacked in Civ was the ability to manipulate, to make long-term plans and then have them come to fruition. And so, like, all of the, now all of the favors achievements um, are named after quotes from the Godfather. And <laughs> the, the link should be obvious. Like the favors is not a benign system. You're, you're, you're meant to use it to like mess up everybody. So we've been cultivating a diplomatic relationship with Suzanne Fielding throughout the course of the game here. Um, we've been, uh, we've established some trade routes with her. We have uh, two trade vessels that we've made here. But there's this, um, what looks like an island off, off of our coast, and that's actually a giant alien called the Kraken, which <laughs> is, not, is not good for business. <clears throat> so we've um, driven some destroyers over here, and we'll see if we can't take out the Kraken so that we can free up our shipping lanes. Yeah, this, it's a giant landmass, so these cannons are not going to do much. We're going to whittle it down here, though. So we almost took it out. So close. So close. Fortunately, uh, we have a couple air units in our city ready to go. See how they do. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> okay. So that has cleared the shipping lane. We can continue to, to uh, trade with Suzanne uh, across the pond here. But she has some other problems that we need to help her deal with. If we'll hop over here. Her neighbor is Vadim Kozlov, and he has gone hardcore down the supremacy track, even farther than uh, Suzanne herself has. And um, a little earlier in the game, we decided to excavate uh, an expedition site that was pretty close to him, and he hasn't really forgiven us since. He's the kind of guy that holds a grudge. Um, and war is about to break out, and in the words of Pete Murray, what would a civilization demo be without declaring war on someone? Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and do that. So you can see that he, he has gone hardcore down the supremacy direction. He's all kitted out with all these cybernetic augmentations. His uh, costume is very ornate and has changed uh, significantly since we would have seen him earlier in the game. But no matter, we'll press forward. Yep. 
yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, one of the fundamental uh, differentiating characteristics of the affinity system here is that they represent distinctive gameplay styles. This is very important to us uh, to kind of build this into the mechanics of, of affinities. Um, Supremacy, which, which is Kozlov right now, is all about uh, battlefield positioning and tactical geometry. So the, the individual units are much weaker, but when combined in certain configurations on the battlefield, they become very strong. Um, purity, uh, which we are playing currently, is sort of the opposite of that. It's raw power. It's more like guns. more guns, you know, big, big levitating tanks, right? <laughs> so um, we'll see how they match up. We need to disrupt his formation in order to win here. Now that saber's really tough. We've got something for him a little later. But first, let's try out the Aegis. Um, the Aegis down here is a really cool unit. When he's been upgraded one more level, he gets to attack twice, which makes him great for crowd control. But he'll be pretty good against these, uh, these units here. Eventually. Yeah. Almost. Okay. Now, we still, uh, we've, we've, we've pretty, pretty well uh, decimated the ground forces here. We still have the Sabre to worry about. Fortunately, though, we've parked um, an offensive orbital satellite, a tactical satellite, uh, the Planet Carver, <coughs> to help us out. So let's see what this does. Oh, still didn't kill him. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, so now we're going to bring out the big guns in a very literal <laughs> sense. This is the Lev Destroyer. Um, this is the sort of epitome of, uh, of the purity philosophy on, on military might. And legend has it that each one of these things actually contains an earth relic. And if the commander doesn't bring the earth relic back, his court martial is very short. Um, so we'll see what this thing does. There we go. Okay, so we have uh, successfully um, uh, we've successfully dealt with this incursion by Vladimir Kozlov. We can, I think, march to victory with our partner Suzanne Fielding. Um, this is a very uh, brief glimpse into the late game of Sid Meier's Civilization Beyond Earth. It's a uh, it's a really really exciting game, and we can't wait for you guys to get your hands on it. And you will get. <laughs> And the moment you will get your hands on will be in October on the 24th. Anybody non-American here, like maybe from across the pond? It will be an international ship date. I'm German, I'm really excited about that. Everybody <laughs> on the whole world will be able to buy this game on the same day. Um, that's pretty awesome. And then they'll all get along super diplomatically in multiplayer oh, matches. <laughs> Always. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, obviously that demo was packed with a ton of stuff uh, that I think everyone here wants to hear a lot more about. Uh, so let's start with the affinity system because that we saw that with the uh, you know the purity sort of how it affected the your land management and then with the supremacy how even though people who are of the same affinity they don't necessarily get along. There's it's sort of a a pervasive thing throughout all the game elements. Uh, so I guess let's, let's just start talking affinities. Sure, the affinity system is, is cool because it's, I think all civilization games make some philosophical statement to their players. And uh, civilization in the past has, has said, you know, what if? What if this combination of things were true? What if, you know, uh, Gandhi had nukes or Genghis Khan was an economic powerhouse or, you know, there, there are these, there are these kinds of scenarios that you set up in Civ, and what this game asks is what is next? Like, given a, a thousand years from now, what do we look like? Who are we? Uh, do we even resemble uh, the human beings that we are today? Uh, and th so that's the question that this game poses, and we, when we developed the game early in its design, came up with three very evocative 
um, answers to that question, harmony, purity, and supremacy. Uh, harmony is about becoming indigenous to the new planet. We were sort of destructive on old earth. Uh, we want to become more like the indigenous life that's already there. And this doesn't mean um, space hippies or anything. I mean, you know, your harmony player can be, can be teched up and pretty militarily vicious. Uh, so not the Navi is what we're getting at. Not necessarily, anyway. Um, and then there's supremacy, which says uh, we want to be planet agnostic. We don't want the planet to determine our destiny anymore. We're going to change our physiology. We're going to augment ourselves with machines so that we can live anywhere and it won't matter. And then um, purity, which I think is the most interesting, is a rejection of both of those. Um, and this, this is kind of comes from a lot of inspirational places. Canticle for Leibowitz is, is a big one. But it's like they, they really venerate old earth in a way that none of the others do, almost to a religious, fanatical degree. And they reject both of these, um, uh, these, these other solutions. They say, we want to keep uh, ourselves pure. We're not going to change our biology. We're not going to augment ourselves with, uh, with machines. We're going to build the biggest guns. And we're going to change this planet into old earth. And that's their approach. So you can see how the diplomatic landscape could be colored by this, the military landscape could be colored by this. It's a fundamental change to the way Civ works is, and is unique to Beyond Earth. So the, that's a really good description of like philosophically what it would be, what you would think emotionally would be like to play these things. But we're also really excited to tell you about how they actually play and what you, how this, your game's going to be like if you're playing as one of these affinities or playing against them. So. Um, just to uh, just start on the end, Harmony players, um, because of their emphasis on uh, sort of becoming symbiotic with the planet, they have, uh, they're, they're very growth heavy. They have a lot of advantages that they gain from the natural landscape, from the terrain. They have a lot of territory. Um, they have, I think, the, the biggest toolbox for how to deal with the aliens. Um, it's an interesting question we get a lot that Harmony doesn't always necessarily mean that you're friendly with the aliens, at least not all the time. It just means that you're, you're able to manipulate them to a great, much greater degree and tolerate their presence to a much greater degree than any of the other civs. So you can leave them alone and, and eventually get uh, friendly status with the aliens quicker and more easily. Um, and then the natural things that benefit the aliens, like, um, like uh, miasma, which is the sort of alien-ish, the fungal gas that in covers the planet that's really bad for you when you first land. If you're the harmony player, you can eventually make that your, your friend. You can make it so that you heal in miasma just like the aliens do. You move faster through the terrain like the aliens do. You start to learn the lessons of the planet and incorporate it into the way your sieve works. So it's in your interest, for instance, to, to grab lots of planetary surface, to leave it relatively uh, intact and, or improve it very intelligently, uh, not to antagonize the aliens too much, especially if you want to use them as sort of like a proxy army late in the game, uh, but definitely to like uh, sort of steer clear of the, um, the more invasive tactics of um, the, the other two affinities and um, Whenever you were to, if you were to bump up against them, to, to do what you can to, to keep them from overrunning your territory or overrunning the, um, the, the surface so that you don't have room to grow and don't have room to expand. Um, you guys want to talk about? Well, actually, about? before we head on to the other uh, affinities, I want to clarify something about aliens. Because you sort of, you land on a planet, you're starting your sieve. It's tempting to think of aliens as barbarians and to yeah. sort of treat them in the way that you've treated them in past sieves. But... I think you guys saw from the Kraken that aliens are a whole different breed and a whole different kind of entity you're going to have to tackle. Yes, yeah, very much so. Yeah. You want to go ahead? Yeah, and aliens are definitely very different than barbarians, and we've seen Civ 5 players, really good Civ 5 players, jump into this game and play just like they played Civ 5 with barbarians, and it didn't always turn out so well. <laughs> Basically, what happens is that you notice the aliens are getting more hostile towards you, and at some point, they call in their bigger brothers, let's Mayor, say. Yeah, significantly stronger than what you can deal with. So the Kraken is one example. Right. You might have seen the siege worms in earlier coverage. So once those things are closing in on your cities because you messed up all the aliens, like the small aliens around you, you're in pretty big trouble. So um, yeah, it's basically a decision for you. Do you want to take them on and deal with the consequences? Or do you want to try and avoid them? Which isn't always easy because they're kind of annoying. They're all around you and you might want to get rid of them because there's this juicy spot in that yeah. forest right outside your borders that you want a city but there's an alien nest. So mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Decisions. Actually, one of the most interesting things I find when I'm playing the game about it is that the aliens often occupy what we call kind of internally wild areas. And it's actually something that the map generator uses. It kind of generates these alien heavy areas that are not just full of hostile life forms, but also full of really rich resources and great land. So it's not a great site for your, your, your first city, but once, you know, especially if you're going military early on, you can, take, you can take out an alien nest, clear it out from aliens, and you have a really strong foundation for another city. But you have to risk pissing them off a whole lot, which can backfire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all had that happen on us. It's yes. not a <laughs> yeah. glorious feeling. Uh, well, of course, different affinities will have different approaches to aliens. Harmony, uh, the most sort of distinctive. Uh, but we were just sort of getting a look there at the um, unit differences between different affinities, the way that your civilization evolves to look so substantially different. We saw it in the, the portraits of the leaders. We saw it in the units themselves. Um, can we talk a little bit about one of the other, sort of get into uh, maybe supremacy a little bit and sort of chart maybe a course for how a supremacy-based civ would go about their business? Supremacy is all about um, Firaxite and superconductors and <clears throat> fast computers. And their cities take on this very interesting angular look, um, kind of like uh, path of least resistance, you know, why circuit boards look the way they do, it's all path of least resistance. And uh, you, so their cities start to take on this very ominous, almost uh, dark, sleek look. Um, and with these kind of yellow accents from the, from the Firaxite that they use. Um, but it's not just the cities that change, it's your units that change as you upgrade them through the unit up upgrading system. Uh, your, your leaders change. Uh, we saw LOD, I think, a couple slides back, um, depending on how they're uh, adopting different affinities. So it's this aesthetic change to accompany the really significant um, mechanical differentiation between the civs. Yeah, and there was, a, there was a picture earlier of the carrier, the naval carrier, and how it, um, how it changes based on each of the affinities. And this is something that's common to most of our basic units. Um, even the soldier that you start with, um, there was some on the battlefield in the demo, and they had changed to look very purity, and they had adopted the purity technology. And that actually plays differently than a Marine that took the Harmony technology and incorporated that into itself. So, you know, the Harmony units will take advantage of being stronger miasma, moving through the terrain, the stuff that Dave was mentioning. Whereas, um, you know, the other units will behave differently. Supremacy will have a lot of Battlefield bonuses for being next to friendly units, targeting units far away. Purity is about raw strength and shooting. Uh, they have more ranged units than the other affinities, so they can kind of like bombard from very far away with as many guns as possible. Uh, the units here, so you know, the the, the Harmony carrier once it, once it gets upgraded, um, will actually heal the airplanes that are stationed there. So you can kind of make a strike, and they will. You can kind of wait a few turns for them to heal up because uh, Harmony is very good at kind of healing their own units and taking care of a lot of numbers. Um, whereas the supremacy carrier will actually boost the uh, the airstrike range of the of the planes that are stationed there as well. So like um, you know you can kind of make more surgical strikes further inland if you're playing supremacy. We call that guy the star destroyer. <laughs> yeah, for sort of the triangle shape. That sounds apt. Uh, well, let's in terms of you talking about affinities and sort of where a trajectory can take you. You know, way down the line, how what sort of tactics are involved. That puts me as a civ sort of strategist in mind, like do I need to, I, it behooves me to choose one right from the get-go, right, and just dedicate myself purity the whole way, but that's also kind of a limiting way to play the game if you're just automatically making every decision based on I want this, in, this affinity. It's, it's a valid way, but you guys are, it seems like you're doing stuff to sort of make it not so deterministic, make it not a choice you make at the beginning and that's it. Yeah, it's sort of half and half, I'd say. Um, and this is another kind of statement as game designers that we're making about how humanity can adapt to a new world. But you can research technologies in the tech tree, hardcore, that will drive you into the direction of one of the, of the affinities, regardless of what your environment is like. But it does behoove you to cater to your, your setting because it's a very hostile planet. And if you don't kind of analyze that early and make, make good decisions early, you're gonna be fighting an uphill battle. And the game is kind of intelligent about that. One of the other ways that you get uh, affinity um, level and points is through the quest system. And at a certain point, the quest system says, okay, you're no longer trying to figure out which affinity you are. You've dedicated yourself to one. We're gonna reinforce that with quests that, that bolster that. So the, the game systems are sort of intelligent about when you're sort of trying to figure it out and when you've decided. Yeah, in addition to the, um, the quest that sort of uh, increase your gameplay devotion to the affinity, they also flesh out the narrative of what's happening to your people. Like there's a, there's a supremacy quest called Solid State Citizen, 
And there's, it tells, like, if, if you take the time to read the text, or even if you don't, you kind of, like, get this sense, and, you know, we, we dress both. But you get this sense of, like, what's happening to your society on a fundamental level. And, like, you know, you see the cities changing as you change your affinities. It's not just your units on the battlefield. It's your everyday people, the people that are working on farms, the people that are working your improvements, the people that are running the government, and, like, what's happening to them? How are they changing? How is humanity changing as a whole? Mm. Well, and not as a whole, because... Similar to the way the quest system responds to what you're preferring to do, the AI will, simil will also respond. And there's a, there are some, um, there's some tailwinds in the systems to make the AI prefer the affinity choices that you're not taking. So that by the time the game is over, there's an interesting spectrum of perspectives on the planet. And when I use the phrase interesting spectrum of perspectives, what I mean is there's a lot of conflict. <laughs> like, people are not getting along anymore. The stakes really rise over the course of the game. And this is really expressed through one of the things we like the most, which is um, all of the victories have been totally redesigned. And three of the five um, are affinity devotion victories. So when you have like killed your affinity and devoted yourself all the way to the end, it comes along with this sort of epic quest that lasts for the whole game that results in this one gigantic um, final move where you build this planetary wonder. It's a a wonder that's so big it takes an entire tile. The city has to pick a, a plot in its working radius and put it there. And it is a city-sized building. It's its own combat entity. Other armies can come in and blow it up. And you have to defend it. Yeah, you have to defend it. It's very delicate. Um, but you build it and then you use it to win the game. So by the end of the game, um, every, every Civ on the, on the planet is trying to set up their victory attempt. And there's just like strife and tension and disagreement all over the place. So it's not, it's not very easy to play a peaceful conclusion to Civ Beyond Earth, because really what you're competing to do with the other Civs is, is dis decide who's right about who's gonna, what humanity is going to be now. If you decided that humanity is going to be robo people with their brains uploaded into machines, somebody across the planet has a different idea about that, and only, only one of you can be right. So when you, when you set up your victory attempt, they're setting up their victory attempt. The AI is going like, uh, to make sure that um, sort of one of everything is tried, and you have to win the game by simultaneously progressing your own and thwarting theirs, which is where things like favors can come in handy, but also, you know, a lev destroyer or two um, <laughs> yeah. might be efficacious in the, at that moment. Yeah, and just as like a, like one of the, I think the coolest examples is, uh, like in the gameplay demo we just showed, we were playing a purity kind of approach, and, uh, you know, uh, Fielding and Kozlov were both supremacy. If we had played that out to the end game, uh, and if we were going for our purity promised land victory, what we would be trying to do is build a warp gate to bring people from Earth. We reestablish contact with Earth. We bring Earthling settlers to this new planet that we've prepared for them. And we start settling the new planet. Uh, you know, here's the new Earth uh, we've, we've cultivated for you. And like, we are the new humanity on this planet. Supremacy, on the other hand, is also building a warp gate. But they are building it to send people back to Earth in order to emancipate them from their organic meat bodies. <laughs> <laughs> so those two approaches aren't really compatible, and you might have some problems. Even fielding our good trade partner probably wouldn't like us at the end if we're not careful. <laughs> and I think that's one of the most fascinating things uh, to sort of to think about when in the development process of Beyond Earth is the way that you guys are sort of tracking that trajectory from early game to late game and how it's spanning centuries, because you don't have the... I don't know if I'd call it a luxury, but the existing framework of human history that starts in the you know, Bronze Age and ends up with the internet to sort of frame the whole thing. And so through affinities, through changing the terrain and the way that all your units are, you're, you're visually showing. Uh, and then through the tech web, you're, mm -hmm. you're charting path through science. It's, it seems like that has been basically the core challenge of this entire game is to sort of set out those boundaries now that you don't have that historical basis to go on. That's very true. It was very challenging. We have a really experienced team that is so good at charting history. And now they got to apply that knowledge and that skill they all have to discover the future of what they think will happen. So it was very challenging because it's just you can't go on Wikipedia and just look up what those things will look like <laughs> in a few hundred years. Um, but on the other hand, it was also hugely exciting. We obviously have a lot of sci-fi fans at the studio, and they were just like, oh, God, we get to make up stuff and like just make up robots and make up like mutated things. And so there was huge excitement and some challenges, definitely. Um, on the art side, 
obviously, but I know the, the designers yeah. had the same approach where they were like, okay, we can do all these things now we probably couldn't do in an historic SIF because this didn't really happen on Earth, so yeah. it's like, wouldn't quite fit. We're not going that alternate history in SIF usually, except for uh, sometimes scenarios. Scenario sometimes, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. It's, um, it's yeah. really like, Civilization, or actually all Firaxis games, really are all based to some degree on on myth, like a cultural myth that we have. So even XCOM has little gray men and flying saucers. And you, you look at our other games like Pirates and Railroads and Civilization, all of these things are built around sort of uh, built-in cultural knowledge that we can leverage to, to deliver things for gameplay reasons, like we need exposition, we need context, and we need heuristics to help the player navigate an otherwise very complicated gameplay space. And as designers, this is one of the hardest things for us to do because we had to go back and, and invent something that at the same time um, uh, was accessible and approachable to people, but also met the expectation of awesome sci-fi. And that was a, a tricky balance to strike, and it, we did so by sort of incremental progress. So you kind of start in a conventional place and work your way out to more uh, elaborate um, um, places, more sci-fi places in the tech web and in other parts of the game. And we also wanted to build a narrative system that didn't trample on the player's ability to tell their own stories. That's one of the magical parts of civilization and, and strategy games in general, is just to, to be able to be this procedural storytelling engine for you. Uh, and we needed to get our context in there, our, our um, exposition in there, without compromising that. And that was a challenge for us, mm -hmm. um, but I think we've done it. <laughs> And one of the neat ways you guys have done it, and I've, I've played about 70 turns of this so far, so very early game, but right from the start, that quest system you mentioned kicked in. And, uh, you know, I sort of, you sort of think of a quest, you sometimes think of it as, oh, I gotta go, you know, investigate this area or explore something, there's a sort of destination. But a lot of these quests are really just little decisions that you're making about, hey, this scenario came up, imagine what that would be like, how should we deal with it? And, can you talk a little, just a little bit about sort of where that sort of writing comes from, how it helps you build your narrative, sure. and you know the little gameplay boost kickers that you sort of incentivize with? Any, anybody play this old game called Act Razor? Anybody play this? Yeah. You remember in the original Act Razor when like your the the you know humans on the ground would come and like beg you for things, like please please help me with this, decide. Um, it, it's kind of like that. There's some quests that are kind of like that where there's small choices that you make. And each choice is good, like there are no bad choices. Um, each choice is good, um, but it, it specializes your sieve. It uh, ornaments your sieve with these little bitty bonuses down the way and gives you a little bit of insight into what's going on in those cities or what's going on in those improvements. A, a window into a, um, a, a part of civilization that we traditionally have not explored before, which is what happens to the little people um, that, your, that your sieve has, right? Uh, so there, there are those kinds of quests, and then, and then there are much grander ones, like uh, Anton mentioned the Solid State Citizen, that's one of a series of very long quest chains, or the victory quests. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're all there, and um, it's a system that serves a lot of purposes. It serves to teach the game to new players, it serves to deliver this narrative content, and it also serves for, you know, to, to specialize your sieve, and to make the civil, the, even if you're playing the same sieve with the same loadout, you can make different quest choices, and that'll, uh, It'll be different every time you play. Um, so it's another axis of choice. One other system that I know Anton has been dreaming about while working on the Civ 5 expansions <laughs> was the orbital layer. Yeah, that's right. So um, the orbital layer is basically, for those of you familiar with Civ 5, it kind of breaks the one unit per tile rule. Like, so Civ 5 has a lot of really interesting tactics because military units, you can only have one on a tile at a time, you gotta move them around, shuffle them around. Um, but the orbital layer is a really interesting concept because we, again, because we're starting from science fiction, not from history, we can say, well, you know, like, what if there's satellites just hanging out above the planet from pretty early in the game? You, the, um, you can find a resource pod on the map while you're exploring turn five, turn 10, and it will have an intact solar collector, the basic economic satellite that you saw in the demo. And you can launch it over your city, you can launch it over someone else's city if it's an offensive one, and just having them hang out up there and have persistent effects that are affecting the ground below is a really cool sort of like 
area of effect buff channel that we didn't really have in Civ 5. We had great generals and other things, but they were kind of hard to visualize. And so the orbital layer, especially since we're starting with science fiction already, it just is something that was really cool to experiment with and something that wouldn't be possible in a historical Civ game. It's also kind of a different uh, the kind of land battle, right? Because right. once your civ is pretty well developed, your culture borders are intact, those aren't going to shift unless there's open warfare and exchange or destruction of cities. But this, this sort of, you can on, only one satellite can be covering a certain area at one time. Right. But satellites can last like six turns, ten turns. They degrade, they fall out of orbit. And so areas that you maybe had controlled, you're not going to have them controlled in 12 turns. You've got to plan for that. Right, yeah. So um, on the screenshot here, that kind of blue two hex radius is the, uh, is the orbital unit's area of effect. And it can't overlap with the area of effect of any other satellite. So that makes for some really interesting decisions. So like you have a miasmic repulsor there. Um, and what that does, it's a very short term satellite. You'll see in the bottom left, there's like zero out of six turns that's in orbit. But by the time it finishes its job and it falls back to the planet, all the miasma in that blue area will be gone. So if you're playing purity, if you're playing supremacy, if you're trying to expand to a new city, if you're trying to like clear out some miasma in between you and an enemy player, um, it's a really great play. Um, but you know, while that's up there, you can't have a satellite that would overlap with it. So you might be sacrificing you know a spot for an economic satellite over the city that you have there. So, and you know, once the miasmic repulsor comes out of orbit, it's room for you to put up another satellite or for someone else to put up one there instead. So you kind of, there's this kind of like land battle that's happening in orbit and it kind of changes throughout the game because there's always new things coming up and old things coming back down. All right guys, well we've got about five minutes left and uh, with all this sort of imagination, creativity, all this stuff that you guys are, I mean, making up for the game or drawing from all these different sources, uh, there's been some some strange little things that have happened along the way, and you guys have teased me on a few of these little goofy <laughs> anecdotes. But I think that the crowd's gonna really get a kick out of these. So let's let's dive into these and tell some strange stories from the world of game development, uh, real quick to wrap up. Are you ready, Anton? <laughs> oh, okay. This is me. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> this was Halloween last year. Um, I was I, I went to work. One of the cool things we do at Forex is at Halloween. Um, we got a lot of a lot of coworkers that have kids. David just became a new father a few months ago. Um, yeah. Actually happened when he was going to E3. He had to turn around and fly back. <laughs> and I had to do it by myself. <laughs> Thanks. No E3. Hey. No E3. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Lena was there. Lena was there. Yeah. Sorry, Lena. <laughs> she made sure I showed up on time. So, um... Uh, lost my train of thought. Right, so we have kids that come in a uh, Halloween, you know, around like four or five towards the end of the workday, but before trick-or-treating proper starts. And they come around and we set out candy for them and they come grab it and say trick-or-treat and stuff. So I was dressed up, like many of our coworkers, in costume. And I was, uh, in case you couldn't tell, Dr. Horrible, uh, which is one of my favorite things. And um, so I was designing uh, unit upgrades at the time, which have changed like so much since then. And so there's a lot of weird... Um, <laughs> names in the background there, like my house, which I, I can't describe, I don't know. So I was just coming up, I was just like kind of spitballing a lot of different ideas for cool unit upgrades that we could have, and I was in costume, and Will or Dave or someone with a camera said turn around, and I just made a goofy face, and now here I am with full of regret. Full of regret. <laughs> Anton is like, a, he's a designer that really likes the whiteboard, so when, he, when he's working hard, it's like a beautiful mind, you know, he just like numbers. scribbles, numbers everywhere, and all this. Um, so yeah, that, that's where that came from. So th this was me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> the, U, the UI artists on the team and I, this is Whitney Bell and Tronster Hartley, have a very tight iteration loop. And we're fixing bugs and stuff, and it, to, to submit a bug takes a little bit of time. So I just got in the habit of sending them emails with these images of things that I saw. And <laughs> got tired of drawing on them, so I started Photoshopping funny things in there. Um, <laughs> it's Ace Attorney. Uh, yeah, so there's that one. There's that one. <laughs> there's that one. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. delicious. <laughs> so, Phyraxite is um, uh, one of the strategic resources. The, it's, its very name is a, is a funny story. It's like the Roxbus, where it was one of the very first things we wrote into the game. It was orange crystal. It's a superconductor called Phyraxite. <laughs> and this, we just like made it all the way through the project with nobody actually. <laughs> getting up the courage to change it. <laughs> so we just got out the other end, and now forever it will be Phyraxite. But our artists were like, all right, it's called Phyraxite, so make it look like the Phyraxis logo. 
before. <laughs> we nah, not, not, not quite. <laughs> you took a wrong turn there somewhere, and now it's instead of the Phyrexis uh, logo, it's the Bloomin' Onion. From... <laughs> okay. We better have those at the launch party. Yeah. Um, and then there was pre-E3. <laughs> um, Pre-E3 is an event for press, and we were all prepared, and as a producer, you're a bit nervous because you get to show the game to press for the very first time, and you know, there's still a lot of stuff to do. You have all the things in your mind that still need to be finished. Nothing's quite there yet. There's bugs and everything, so you're really nervous, but the build was tested very thoroughly, and we were ready, and we were so happy about where the build was at, and then we arrived, in Los Angeles and had everything set up and ran through the demo <laughs> um, an hour before the event started just to double check that everything was um, working well and then um, PC games development totally bit us backside <laughs> because there's so many graphics cards and so many settings in this world and that specific one that we had at that event with the exact setup did not quite, um, be, wasn't quite represented in our QA department, so to all of our shock, suddenly mouse attacks were staring us in the face, <laughs> eyeballs, and um, luckily the, the journalists were really, um, really... Delighted. Delighted, yeah. yes. They had a lot of fun, I think. And in hindsight, I actually find this hilarious. At the moment in time, it wasn't quite as hilarious. But right now, I think that's actually a really funny screenshot. Um, we figured out what it was. We figured out what it was. It's fixed now, but bloody hell. Yeah. How do these things always happen? <laughs> that's was pretty it. much the look on my face, yes. <laughs> that one's actually pretty tame. The one with teeth were even worse. Sometimes uh, the teeth Sometimes the teeth would show up. Terrifying. Gross. Yeah. I think those were, that's one of those moments where I realized that like, we had hit the big leagues now. Because I think it was Josh or Garrett or somebody who's like, oh, hell, we'll just go and buy graphics cards. Go buy all the graphics cards in Los Angeles. <laughs> and they were ready to like, run out the door and just raid Best Buys. Um, but we fixed the problem. And... Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, as much as I'm sure we'd all love to keep picking your brains about Civilization Beyond Earth for the rest of PAX, uh, we got to wrap up and get out of here for the next panel. So. Let's hit a few things before we go. We got some Exoplanets map pack to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, so the Exoplanet map pack is really awesome. This is a great incentive to get the game early. Um, these, uh, the game will come with several uh, maps that are based on real exoplanets. Um, most notably, Kepler-186F, which is actually named after Sid Meier. It's pretty cool. Um, so those are really fun. Lots of interesting challenges there. So go pre-order the game. If you haven't already. If you haven't already. And also, uh, board game something. Yes. So a special shout out to our guys, at, our friends at Fantasy Flight. The XCOM board game is playable at PAX. Go find these guys. It is a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. And the next event coming up, Phyraxicon. Yeah, yeah. we'll have Phyraxicon. Uh, is sold fall. out. Yeah, it's sold out. <laughs> but I'm kind of hoping we'll meet some of you there, maybe. In Maryland, beautiful Maryland. And if, you and if you follow Civ Games on Twitter and on Facebook, there are some tickets that will be released, I believe, closer to the event, so you still got a chance to go ahead and attend Phyraxicon. There we go. All the social media information you could ever want. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please give, me, give them a big round of applause. <laughs> developers of Civilization Beyond Earth. Now I know a lot of you want to kind of like do the like hang out, maybe ask them another question thing before, just after the panel ends, but we have to run to a live demo actually on the GameSpot stage. But it's just a block and a half away at the Metropole restaurant, which we've renamed Sector G, and we're giving away food and drinks and you can come watch the demo and maybe chat with them afterwards if you want to. So we're hustling over there. Just and follow us. <laughs> just follow us and have a great PAX.